Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to this early and uh, chilly uh, little panel. Um, uh, so we are here to talk about a, a, a topic that has, for some people, kind of faded from view. HIV, uh, you know, a lot of people might think of it as something from the 1980s or 1990s, but in fact, it still kills nearly a million people around the world today. So we're here to learn about the dynamics that uh, are causing that to happen, uh, why it's still happening, and, and what we can do about it. Uh, joining me here are James Curran, who is the current Dean of Public Health at Emory University Rollins School of Super Public Curran. Health, and co-directs the Emory Center for AIDS Research. Uh, Mark Dybel, who's the co-director of the Center for Global Health and Quality, and a professor at Georgetown University Medical Center. Anthony Fauci, who is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And Claire Sturck, who is president of Emory University's uh, Charles Howard Candler, uh, she is, I'm sorry, the president of Emory University and the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Public Health. Um, great. Well, so, uh, and Dr. Fauci, you were saying something uh, interesting earlier, which is that we could actually end the epidemic tomorrow. We have the technology. Uh, what is getting in the way? Well, it becomes um, a very complicated implementation issue. If we had this conversation 25, 30 years ago before we had good drugs for HIV, we would say we have a real public health problem. We don't have the tools to address the problem of treatment and prevention. But in 2019, from a variety of avenues of science, it's very clear that if you get a person who's HIV infected and you treat them and bring down the level of virus to below detectable, not only will you save the life of that person, but you will essentially make it impossible for that person to transmit the virus to someone else. That is a huge issue there. The other thing is we know that we have pre-exposure prophylaxis treatment for people at risk that if they take a pill once a day in a high-risk situation, you decrease by 97% the likelihood that they will acquire HIV infection. So if you put those two things together and think about it, theoretically, and, and that's theoretically, if you implemented both of those to its fullest, you could end the epidemic. Because if you treated everybody that was infected, nobody would infect anybody else if some slip through and you give PrEP to others. The real issue is now we've got to implement it. And the implementation is easier said than done because the social determinants and other things that get in the way of implementing, stigma, populations that are at higher risk but disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. So when I say we can end it, I don't mean, OK, we're good, let's move on to something else is we can end it, but now we have a real challenge of implementation. That's what I meant. And when you talk about PrEP, uh, talk a little bit more about that, because it's not actually just treating the person who actually has HIV. It's also bringing in PrEP, because otherwise the incidence well, doesn't go down, right? Yeah, well, there are studies that have been done that we have funded in, in Africa and other uh, places throughout the world that even if you put a full effort into identifying people who are infected and treating them, and getting that virus to below detectable level where they won't infect anyone else, the fact is that the incidence of infection in those regions doesn't substantially go down unless you also put PrEP in there. Because when you put pre-exposure <coughs> prophylaxis, then you start to see the incidence go down. So you've got to do both. You always got to do both. Right. And several of you were involved in the, in the PEPFAR program from an, from an early kind of era. Um, uh, what is it, what has the impact of PEPFAR been, and what is the future of the program? Well, yeah, so Tony and I were very involved from the day one uh, when it was just an idea in President Bush's head. Um, the impact is, is breathtaking. And, uh, you know, you can do it in Live Saved, which is around 17 million people. Uh, when PEPFAR was launched, 50,000 people in low and middle income countries, virtually all of them in Brazil, were receiving antiretroviral therapy. Now it's over 20 million in low and middle income countries, mostly in Africa. But the best way to put a face on it is uh, if you went into a village in anywhere, and I was privileged to do this as Tony was in, in Africa in, the, uh, in 2000, it was the most depressing place on the planet. Everyone and with good reason, thought they were going to die. Every house had multiple graves of the fathers and the mothers. There were <coughs> villages entirely run by orphans mm. because all the parents were gone. Uh, countries were going to cease to exist, literally, 
30% of adult population, 75% of pregnant women in places in Botswana were HIV positive and they were all going to die. So the health, what that led to is a hopelessness. Right. And, and so if you think you're going to die and everyone in your family's going to die, why would you get educated? Why would you look for a job? Why would you do anything? And so the hopelessness uh, was was palpable. It, it was the most depressing place to be. So you can look at the numbers, which were horrific, but it was the human experience of that that was fundamental. Now you go, and I'm privileged to go to the same villages that I went to 20 years ago. They're vibrant, dynamic. People are energetic. There's leadership. You know, it's an extraordinary. Basically, it saved a continent. Wow. Now I want to be clear that the United States provided the resources, but the implementation was done by the Africans. And that was one of the amazing things about PEPFAR. We used to just do pilot projects. This was national scale. Mm -hmm. National scale can only be done by the people in the countries. And it was really the leaders and the people in the countries from the village level to the top. And I, just to segue to what Tony was talking about, we could end the epidemic in Africa, too. But we're not, and in fact, I think we're at the highest risk of losing control of the epidemic we've ever been at. When I say that, people are very upset, and the reason is young people. So the size of the population of Africa is projected to double by 2050. Um, populations, countries in Africa, will have 75% of their population 35 and younger. That is the most at-risk group for HIV. So if you're doubling the size of that population, even if you cut HIV infections by 50%, you're still treading water. Right. But the problem is young people don't seek health anywhere, uh, particularly um, uh, if you talk to young people in Africa, and we have the data, young people are getting tested at half the rate of older people. Hmm. So if you don't get tested, how are you gonna access treatment? Or how are you gonna think about PrEP? They don't think about HIV. All the studies show they don't even think about HIV anymore because of the success yeah. of PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. So it gets to, and this is, a, again, when we come to the domestic epidemic, it's the same thing. If you don't get into a, we think health interventions, we just keep building more clinics. You know, If we build it, they will come. We'll just put a clinic closer to people and they'll go. The data are overwhelming, they will not. Huh. It's the social issues. What will a young person go to? What, what type of program will a young person? And they're never going to go to an HIV program, ever. They'll go to a job training program. They'll go to a reproductive health program. Some women will. They'll get access to the internet. They, they have zero interest in an HIV program. So if we don't change, if we don't understand the communities, if we don't get in there, if we don't work with them and understand, we will fail, and we're going to lose control of the epidemic, and it's not too dissimilar from where we are in the US. If you don't get into the community, right. we used to do this. At the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, it was the community that was responding. We responded to the community. The community's out of the picture now. Um, and they, by the way, they also cost almost nothing. $50,000 would transform a community in Africa. Wait, but so why don't young people go to the, is it because of stigma? They don't want to be seen sitting in the waiting room of an HIV clinic? Part of it is, but part of it is they don't want to go where adults are. Right. So when we asked them, they were like, I'm, I'm never going to that clinic because it's just a bunch of adults. Um, they, they're, this is not unique. Right. Young people yeah. in the United States don't but, seek health. But you know, if you're, not, you're invincible. You're, you're, if you're, you're not thinking about you know, HIV, why and why would, would you go, go to an, an HIV, HIV clinic? clinic? Okay, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> and they're not going to go where all the adults are. So, but when you talk to them, they start to tell you, and I've seen these programs. That's the other thing. There isn't a single delivery problem, to Tony's point, where a community somewhere hasn't solved it. Huh. But we don't talk to them. We don't bring them together. They don't learn from each other. And then even when we do, we don't, we don't link them to policy making so you can actually dedicate your resources in a smart way and have the policies on a national and international level that will respond to that and allow the response. So I'm completely, Tony's absolutely, we could end this epidemic if we just changed what we do and we're, but we're still doing the same things we were doing 20 years ago right. and we just keep pushing the same money through the same funnels, it's right. not gonna work we're gonna fail, and we could lose control of the epidemic in, in Africa. And I wanna, I wanna return to that point, but first, yeah, go ahead. So uh, a lot of us have been working on this uh, since the 1980s, and I was thinking this morning about uh, what's changed and what is the same. And uh, the main things that have changed uh, have been a, a huge uh, breakthroughs in science, uh, and there's a whole lot of them. The most important ones we're talking about today is highly active antiretroviral therapy, 
uh, both as a way of saving millions of lives and also uh, by reducing viral load and preventing transmission to others, and then available as PrEP. Um, and bet much better diagnostic testing. Another thing that's changed a lot is a huge government commitment, which has often been nonpartisan. Public health has always been political, but doesn't have to be partisan. We have to remember the Ryan White program was a bipartisan program. PEPFAR was George Bush's initiative. And now President Trump has an initiative. These are not things that political people would necessarily have predicted. What hasn't changed is the problems of denial, discrimination, and scarcity. And, and the virus hasn't changed. So I, would make a, I want to make a plea for more science here. Uh, the problem with the virus is that it's a silent infection. There are millions of people infected in the world and still millions of people who don't know they're infected. So finding all of them, getting them to be trusted and be in places where they know they're infected and can be diagnosed and then put into treatment is, a, is going to be a major problem that's going to be continuing. The other thing is that treatment is for life. So we're not talking about adherence only for a day or two but for maybe 30 years or 40 years. So we need really very much curative therapy, and we really need a safe and effective vaccine, which Tony's people and Tony's grants are really working very hard on. But we're not talking about something that's going to be over with. Uh, we're going to have tens of millions. If we're, if, we're, if we're successful, we'll have 40 million people infected on therapy for 30 or 40 years. That's success. But that's not good enough, because we're not going to find everybody. So we need to work through this, and we need to deal with denial, discrimination, and scarcity. Discrimination and homophobia is better than it was in 1980, but it's not so good. It's still back. It's two steps forward, one step back. Racism, two step forward, one step back. Uh, health insurance, uh, it's, no, it's no mistake that in the United States, the highest risk uh, communities for HIV are the ones with the highest number of uninsured people. Uh, we paid almost no attention to mental health and substance abuse treatment, which is a problem for many people who aren't in treatment now. We have to coordinate these things. We have to commit more resources, recognize that homelessness is also a problem, that these things are not as simple as do what the doctor says, because many of these people don't necessarily have access to the doctor, and if they do, they may not trust her or him. So we can do it, though because we have made enormous progress socially as well as scientifically, but we need to keep the gas and the pedal in both of these areas. We need more science. We need a cure and a vaccine, and we need a commitment that's joint in our society to bring these things together. Yeah. Okay, if and, I may add yeah, to that, go for just, it. Yeah. and I won't elaborate too much. It's, it's amazing to see where science has gone, where we are today, the progress that has been made. What has stayed the same, and, and Dean Curran said at HIV, the virus is still the same, but we take too much for granted. We forget that there's so many people that we don't meet where they are, and I mean that literally as well as socially. We have a lot of people that fall through the cracks, and we talk about discrimination and, and racism, classism, access. All of that's the case, but when you really go into communities and you start talking with people who are either at risk or people who are infected, it means nothing. Because it's about, about the whole person, the whole community, and the challenge with HIV is you, you don't feel, you don't wake up one morning and you think, I believe I have HIV. That's not the case for other conditions. So we need to get smarter also in the science of understanding people and meeting people where they are. Otherwise, right. we will continue to have an incredible gap between what we can do and what we're not doing because we don't have the kind of relationships that we need to have. And I, and I wanted to pivot onto, onto something you told me earlier, which is, you know, often we, we, we hear about HIV and we think, well, if people just use condoms, then, you know, th we, they could stop the transmission. But you're, you actually said that sometimes it's difficult for women in some of these contexts to insist on, on things like that. Could you say a little more about that? Yeah, I think it's difficult for women, it's difficult for men. So early on in the HIV epidemic, and still today, I, I moved to the United States in, 19, in the mid-1980s, and um, it was a challenge then. My first work was in HIV AIDS, and it still is a challenge. You can teach people the skills, you can provide condoms for free, you can do everything you want. What you cannot do is control the negotiations between two people who are going to have sex. And typically what happens is if you're talking about women or men who engage in sex as a means to survive, to have food, to have a place to live, 
you have a, a dispro disproportionate power between the two partners. And you may be trying to save your life by asking for your partner or you yourself to be able to use a condom and get beat up in the process. Right. That's what I mean in terms of we can know all this that we need to do, but if it doesn't resonate, if we don't try to meet people where they are in terms of doing what can be done, people will continue to get infected. And PrEP might uh, be in the same category because we also are hearing that um, people who are in uh, disadvantaged positions are not using PrEP, partly because they don't trust it, partly because they want people who are going to stigmatize them and hurt them because they want to use PrEP. Right. Treatment is the same. Uh, and we're seeing this in Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, the we, total failure with PrEP in studies right now yeah. um, because people are afraid to be seen taking mm -hmm. antiretrovirals because of the stigma and discrimination and fear and the same thing. And, but the issue with condoms is also in trusted relationships, mm -hmm. people won't use condoms. So sex workers in many countries will use condoms when they're working, but they won't use them with their regular partners and they're actually getting infected from their regular partners because it's a lack of trust. Right. So it, it's a very complex dynamic and it gets to the, if we don't get into the community, talk to them, understand what they will respond to and does it create programs for them, right. we will fail. And what we keep doing, and we're doing, I think, going backwards on actually, is saying, we have this solution, you will do it, we're just gonna build programs, you will come, and shockingly, people don't show up. Right. Because we're not going in, understanding what kind of program. You have to engage in where I work, and this is true in the rural south, and in the inner cities of the United States, you have to engage with the, the faith community. Mm. You, you, you know, a lot of African American men in the south, they're doubly stigmatized, they're black, and they're gay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they can't be because in their communities, being gay is unacceptable. Same in the Latino community. Mm. So they have sex with women too, and then we're getting transmissions there. Same thing is happening in Africa. We see, we have data on this. This is what happens. So the stigma, the discrimination, the, you have, but who's going to change that? You're not gonna change it from the government. Yeah. You, you have to get in the community. You have to work with them. You have to understand who the influencers are. And the really complicated thing is, who those, we're working in Eswatini, a very small country right now, we're working in three municipalities to empower the communities. Well, I hate that word. They're empowered already, supporting them. Right. But what that looks like in one municipality is fundamentally different from another municipality, literally a 20-minute drive away. Because who the influences are, who the people are, who you need to engage is fundamentally different. And until we, if we, we, until we get out of our head, we have the solution. This is the program. Here's the cookie cutter. We're going to take it everywhere and it's going to work until we get out of that and say, get back to the origins of the response of let's get into the community, have the community shape the response, have our resources directed so that the community can respond, share the data so that we can, then we can get to Tony's solution and it will be used. But the way we're doing it now, we, I think we're going backwards. Is not there a forward. reason why that changed? Like, what did someone say? Like, actually, let's just do the same thing in every country. Or how, how did that come about? I, I'm I'll get in trouble for saying this. We have way too many white doctors involved um, yeah. in in the response. <laughs> uh, white male doctors involved in the response. Uh, we, no you offense. know, we, we, I'm one of them. We have three of them. We have three of them up here. I'm not. Uh, we have one, we have one ma female white doctor. Right. But not doctor. literally, you, you've got to get in. You, really, it's the community. It, yeah. It's right. it, it's the community. Um, and uh, sorry, is there like a? Does anyone have a really uh, good, clear example of a time when a community was engaged and that really did? Like, what's a, what's a good example of what Are we should kidding? be doing? Yeah, oh my God. yeah. Take a look. Whoa. <laughs> How about in the 1980s, the late 1980s, when the gay community in the United States galvanized everything that went on? I mean, the most phenomenal, beautiful example of a community stepping to the plate was the gay community in the United States right in the middle of the 1980s to the end of the 1980s, when ACT UP came, yeah. when Project Inform came. That was community. Now, we would never have been where we are right now without that. I mean, we did the science, we provide the tools, but all of that got implemented through the community. You know, and and it is, it's not changed right now. The demography has been a little bit different, but the point that Mark made is really, really important. You know, you've heard about the plan to end it in the United States, but if you look at the situation that we have now in the United States, I mentioned it to you before, 
what people don't fully appreciate, if you look at the map of the United States, it has 3,007 counties, 3,007. Yeah. More than 50% of all of the new infections in the United States are in 48 counties, mm. plus the District of Columbia, plus San Juan. And then there's a cluster of seven states in the South where there's a lot of rural infection. In other words, in Mississippi, it's not just Jacksonville, it's in the rural areas. And getting back to what Mark said, you don't want three guys, three white guys in a suit to go down there and start telling them what they need to do. And that's the engagement we've got to do for the reasons that the stigma is intense, but we've got to engage the people in the community. Otherwise, the plan, which is a great plan, is just not going to work. Yeah. And I also think that in addition to that, we need to work with communities on communities trusting us. So we heard the example about gay men in the 1980s. You can look at the opposite example of injection drug users in the 1980s, which was a group incredibly impacted. You didn't have that trust relationship. You didn't have the social capital to mobilize. And that's what I mean when I talk about people falling through the cracks. Um, you look at uh, syringe exchange programs, which was an example that, that we all knew would work. But because the rest of us in mainstream society felt uncomfortable making syringes available because it would possibly stimulate people from injection drugs. So a lot of this just goes back again to understanding people and be relentless in meeting them where they are. Sorry, I keep on saying yeah, that. Yeah. Because that's the way in which we can truly and fully take advantage of the science that we have. I, let me give you one other an example yeah. from Africa, TASO which is the AIDS organization in Uganda, was started by five people who just got, in the 80s, who were just tired of seeing their entire community die. They had nothing to offer them except for prevention messaging. They created music and dance, and they went village to village to try to get people to reduce their risks of infection. But they also cared for people as they were dying. Huh. This became a national organization, starting with these five people in rural, rural uh, Uganda. It was because that mechanism existed that when PEPFAR came along, they could push antiretroviral therapy out because they, we were trusted in the community. They were in the community. They were linked. They, could go, they were going door to door. CDC you know, funded a program that went door to door by motor scooter to deliver antiretroviral therapy. And it was that program, one of, one of the programs that Tony and I based the plan for, that President Bush loved. He loved seeing the picture of the motor scooters going out to deliver <laughs> antiretroviral therapy. That was done because it was community based. It was all owned, directed by the community. Now if you go to Tasso, they'll say, we, we're, we hit a wall. We're not going to get any further because we're just told what to do. Mm -hmm. We don't have the freedom anymore to go work in the communities to solve these problems. And the rates are going up. Right. And sorry, is there, is there something that unites those counties where all those in infections are had? Like, is there some commonality that they share? Or is it just sort of different in different areas? No, it's different in different areas. I mean, the commonality is that there, the commonality is stigma, unfortunately. I mean, that's really the problem. The CDC and, and HRSA are going to play a major role in getting into that community. I mean, and, they're gonna, and they, know what the, they know what the goal is. The real issue is whether or not we're going to be able to do it. We certainly have the intention of doing that. But as Mark said and as, as, as Jim said, you've got to engage people like, particularly the faith-based organizations. And they, I mean, the clergy, the, the amount of stigma, I never fully appreciated until I went down there, the amount of stigma of being an African-American gay man in a rural community in the South. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's yeah. not good. And the clergy, you're saying, can help people feel less significant. They need to embrace them. I mean, yeah. in the beginning of the epidemic, and that was really unfortunate, that, that the, that the African-American clergy did not fully embrace the African-American gay community. They're doing it much better now, but in the beginning, they did not. Right. Um, well, and, uh, and by the way, we can learn from what happened with PEPFAR, because we had to do the same thing in Africa. The, the, the faith community was very resistant to HIV or to any of the in interventions for HIV because they were afraid it would increase promiscuity. And we actually have an HIV gay epidemic in Africa as well, our people in direct drugs. We deeply engaged the faith community. I mean, and it worked. We had people from the pulpits talking about HIV. The Catholic Archbishop of South Africa, you know, there used to be abstinence, be faithful, uh, use a condom. And he said, mine's ABCD, be faithful, uh, 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 ab abstain, be faithful, use a condom, or you will die. That was the Catholic Archbishop of, of, of Durban. Huh. Uh, 
But the math, by the way, is the same in Africa. We have this impression that Africa ever it's all. If you go into South Africa or Kwazulu or Eswatini, it's the same. The vast majority of the infection is occurring in focal areas. And so you need to get there to respond. But people are also very mobile, so we need to be careful that we don't miss people while they're moving. Hmm. Jim has a. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. There's another kind of broader sense of community <clears throat> that I mentioned before that public health is always political, but it doesn't have to be partisan. What makes it not partisan is, is the community mobilization and the recognition in society that a problem is bigger than partisanship. So the AIDS epidemic began in a very partisan way in the early 1980s with and the man played on and you know the Reagan administration didn't do enough, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually the country began to realize that the problem was more important than the prejudices we held. Um, at that time, however, we didn't feel the same way about drug addicts. And, uh, and, the, and the epidemic in injecting drug users in New York and other places just laid, was terrible. And we didn't do anything about it. My greatest regret from my time at CDC is, is that what we didn't do with the drug using communities. That's changed around a lot with the opioid epidemic, which has become a nonpartisan approach to a problem in which the, it's much larger now, but we see it as something that's been mobilized across society to a, to a nonpartisan or a bipartisan response to a problem which the country perceives, because of the mobilization of communities, to be much more important than their partisan views of a very, very discriminated against population. You know, uh, even the people who, in, in the AIDS epidemic, who, uh, who didn't discriminate against gays and weren't racist, hated drug users. I mean, it was terrible. And now we have a chance to say, this problem is bigger than our prejudices. We need to mobilize communities at a bigger level to get the political support we need to get things done. And the political support's at the local level, the state level, and the national level. Trump, President Trump's initiative is not just important because of money, it's important because they meet with the governor, and then the governors meet with the mayors, and the mayors say, hey, we want to make this thing work. We want to get the drug abuse treatment programs and medication assistance programs and mental health programs the Ryan White programs, the CDC prevention programs, all working together. Because the president says it's important, so therefore the governor says it's important, and the mayor says it's important. And then the communities can get together and have some impact. So they, it, but it begins with community mobilization. Well, and you mentioned something important that I want to make sure we dig into, which is that President Trump does have this recently announced plan to end the HIV epidemic in the U.S. by 2030. So how did that come about? What does it entail? What's, what's going to happen now? Well, you know, it came about, I think, the right people at the right time in the right place in the right circumstances. So, you know, we've been talking about ending the epidemic and the, having the tools to end it for several years. I mean, we've been writing about it the first article I wrote specifically on that was exactly 10 years ago, wow. so it's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, and things didn't just quite gel, and I think we had a combination of when, when Bob Redfield uh, became the director of the CDC, <laughs> he and I had been friends and colleagues for 35 years. We started talking about maybe we can see if we can get the department, it started off with the Department of Health and Human Services, to get the department to be interested in that, so we put together you know, we, we looked at the geographic and the demographic concentration based on that map that I told you about, and we said, you know, this is actually doable. Yeah. So we then presented it to Brett Giroir, who was the assistant secretary. But the real critical issue was Alex Azar, huh. who, was the, who was the secretary of HHS. We brought it to Alex, and Alex bought it. Now, from a historical standpoint, for those of you who don't know, Alex Azar was the um, general counsel for the department under George W. Bush when Mark and I put together the PEPFAR program. Okay. So he knew exactly what was going on. And then he became deputy secretary under Mike Levitt. So when we brought it to Alex Azar, he said, this is fantastic, let's do it. In fact, I'm gonna bring it to the president and see if he will endorse it. Nice. And that's how it happened. So it was just the right place, the right time, and then it happened. A lot of old friends getting back together yeah. again. Well, <laughs> Um, okay, well, yeah, so I wanted to talk, you mentioned the opioid epidemic. I was wondering if that is having an effect on HIV rates in the U.S. You know, there's, you know, syringe uh, exchange programs, but they're not everywhere. Kind of, how is that affecting things? Well, look, uh, 
I'll only say that the opioid epidemic is also going along in, in the United States with the suicide epidemic, the so-called diseases of right. despair. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great concern. It's a, even broader than the opioid epidemic, but is, is something which has infected populations, uh, some of whom have previously been high risk for HIV and some of whom haven't. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen, I mean, who could have expected places like Scott County, Indiana, with uh, one mm -hmm. HIV case going to 180 yeah. in, a, in a period of a year? Uh, in a rural area, it's a rural area of, uh, of, of uh, right. under economic populations. And, and, and CDC has identified uh, dozens of counties right. where injecting drug use are a, a huge problem for hepatitis C, which right. is another greatly neglected problem, and HIV, and are just powder kegs waiting to happen for right. HIV right. transmission. So these things do intersect greatly. Right. It's a, it's a new risk group, Olga, that we're worried about. In fact, I'm actually in the process of finishing off an article that we're going to be putting about just the question yeah. that you asked. We've had established risk groups in which the demography has changed a bit, much more towards African-American men who have sex with men, but it's still men who have sex with men, injection drug users. The problem with the opioid epidemic is that it's adding an additional risk group to an already risk group heavy process. These are rural, mostly white people who are economically deprived. Okay. They were never risk group people for HIV. Now, once you get into injection group, injection drug use under those, then you have a worrisome situation because you could have an explosion the way we happened in, in Scott County, in Lowell, Mass, and places like that where we've had the outbreaks. And I think also in communities where people are not, not used to talking about being at risk and helping each other. So we have a real opportunity going back to community building and, and supporting communities is teaching people how to face the challenges right. and actually turn those challenges and opportunities. Like this is how you can help each other because there's a good um, spirit of community sense and yeah. it's our responsibility to tap into it. And linking them to the mental health issue, I mean, we, there's, there's two young dynamic people who spoke the other day about what they're doing around depression and suicide and, and the link to that. And you, we talked about this earlier about young people. We have a real opportunity because young people are still highly at risk for HIV and direct and drug use. In Africa, that's, that's what, what's driving the epidemic. Young people don't seek health behavior. They don't have health seeking behavior anywhere. They never have, never will. Yeah. We actually have an opportunity with HIV and mental health and putting all these things together to and not us, but them figuring out a way to create a mechanism for young people to engage in health-seeking behavior, using social media, using whatever they're going to use. Imagine that impact then on tobacco use or diabetes, hypertension. You actually have health-seeking behavior if we can create that in young people that will radically change the future of health. As, to, you know, as HIV has been an entry point for many other opportunities, it can be an entry point. And Tobacco-Free Kids does great work in Africa on behavior change with young kids. Uh, Matt Myers sitting here, they do great work. Same stuff, get into the community. We can put this stuff together in a way that could create not just a response to HIV, but a response to health and create a healthy community. But it's not, if you're doing it in a medicalized way, if you're doing it when you get to a clinic, you've already failed because the prevention didn't work. And so we've got to get into the communities on the prevention, the health-seeking behavior, the community-based stuff. And if we put it all together, it's not just for HIV. It's for mental health. It's for opioid use. It's for um, diabetes. It's for hypertension. We can actually have a healthy future, and HIV can be an entry point that we can use for that. Yeah. So, so the, uh, the, HIV, the, the opioid epidemic is another example of how uh, public health can trump partisan politics. It started in Scott County, Indiana, in a rural population. And the, the, the uh, head of the health department at the time was Jerome Abrams, our current Surgeon General. The governor was Mike Pence, our current. And they were, uh, particularly the governor was very much opposed to needle exchange programs at the time. But the Scott County epidemic said, hey, wait a minute, this problem is more important than a philosophical op opposition to, to needle and syringe exchange programs. And it worked. It helped a great deal. And, and Indiana, under his leadership, did something about it at the time. Now, the issue is there are dozens of counties around the country in Appalachia where there are similar problems with hepatitis C and needle and syringe exchange just waiting to become the next Scott County or Lowell Mass. Right. And to get that to happen before there's an AIDS outbreak, 
you know, is, is the trick. Right. To make, to, you know, to take Scott County to West Virginia and Kentucky and all these other places and implement harm reduction programs and, and medication assistant treatment programs there in a timely way before they become AIDS epidemics. Right. And if I could just pick up on that yeah. bipartisanship, because I think it's a, you know, history is such an interesting thing. Mike Pence, when he was a member of Congress, was one of the strongest supporters of PEPFAR. Right. Huh. He gave one of the most important floor speeches when PEPFAR was being reauthorized to go from 15 to $50 billion. And he stood up there and said, look, I'm a social conservative. I'm a fiscal conservative. But there are very few opportunities for us to save millions of lives. I walked into the signing ceremony for the bill with Mike Pence. Um, and this is something people have never really understood. It's the support for PEPFAR and the President's Malaria Initiative and development comes from the socially conservative part of the Republican caucus. Uh, in, in, the, in the US Congress because their faith teaches them that we have a responsibility to others. And so if we don't engage with them, they, we will lose the support for the international programs as well as the domestic programs. You can actually work with each other on common ground and that's why we've had this bipartisanship which we have to hold on to uh, and keep supporting. Well, Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy passed PEPFAR, passed Ryan White broke. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. So I think, do we have mic runners? Yeah, we have a woman with a mic come in. And I think I saw, I don't know, I guess just go to the first hand you see, because I, I didn't see who went up first. <laughs> Hazeltine. Yeah, Bill Hazeltine. Um, one of the uh, programs I've looked at uh, recently in Egypt, which is very different from what you've discussed here on the stage, is 100 million healthy lives, predominantly to control the uh, hepatitis C infection, but also for diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. There, the government has put into place a screening program, low cost and very low treatment. Just to give you an idea, for hepatitis C, it's uh, five, 50 cents for a serology test, $5 for a PCR confirmation, $45 for uh, free treatment. Um, if you don't get yourself tested, you don't get a driver's license. You can't hold a government job. That's a very different approach from the community-based approach that you've just discussed. And I wonder how those two concepts, it's been very effective. They've now, of the something like five million people treated for hepatitis C, uh, they account for about three million of those out of a total population in the world, about 70 million. So I wonder how you react to that kind of program as opposed to getting deeply into the community. You need to do both, right? right. So um, I actually know that program pretty well, too. There's a lot of community mobilization involved in that right. uh, as well. They're getting deep into the communities, and uh, Gilead actually is paying for a fair amount of that. Um, um, uh, it's the same. Look at Rwanda. They've had some of the greatest success. President Kagame led from the top, but then they also right. had community health care workers at the village level and empowering the community and linking it together. So it's actually a boat. You need a top down and bottom up coming together, and that's where you see success. What we have in most places today is just the top down without the bottom right. up. Egypt is doing both, and that's where you will su see success. Right. Another example is if you think about smoking cessation in this country, which was both the movement from the top down, cigarettes got more expensive, they were more difficult to get, fewer places to smoke, but also was community mobilization. So I think we have lots of examples in public health right. of how that has moved us forward. Yeah, I agree you need to do both, Bill, but w one of the issues that we have is that our healthcare system in, the, in this country really excludes a lot of the people we need to get to, and that's really the problem. If we had a, a more diffuse, completely all umbrella encompassing healthcare system, we could implement both ends of what you're talking about. But what you said I don't think would work in a southern state where they have rural people at risk for HIV, just for HIV. So I have a, um, a serious aha moment. I'm a total lay person to all of this, um, but I'm peripherally involved in community organization here, and I see how well it works from trying to understand community perspectives. And you guys keep talking about community and community mobilization. And I wonder if there's a way to filter dollars into community organization type of structures and community organizers so that it can start from the bottom up and go within the communities for people who are seeing the problems and then collectively they see what do they can do to help elevate the need for what you're talking about. But you know, as I sit here looking at the peripheral dollars that or the dollars that go into our community organization, there are no corporate dollars 
per, really, nor government dollars, but is that a way to actually use that money effectively and to try to raise it from the bottom up that way? And yes, that's what I'm working on in Africa and have been doing, and that's what we used to do. So we used, Ryan White, in the beginning, heavily went to fund community-based organizations. Uh, it doesn't anymore. At the beginning, PEPFAR funded enormous resources, and the Global Fund. Yes, community organizations. Correct, organizers, right. and that's what we're losing. You know, as dollars get bigger and bigger, it gets harder and harder to create programs that get down to those places, and that's, that's what we're arguing, that we need to rejigger how we do funding so that the funding can actually get there, and that's why I mentioned what $50,000 in a village in Africa can radically change what happens there. Uh, let's see, um, sir in the front, I, yeah. Hi, Bill Resnick. Um, I heard a presentation a few years ago from San Francisco AIDS Foundation about the city of San Francisco's plan right. to end HIV infection. I don't remember by what year, but I'm curious about what the progress has been right. and whether that can or can't be a model for it. Well, yeah, so what, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that question up because when we made the presentation to, uh, to Secretary Azar, we used three examples. The program is in San Francisco was called a rapid program, treat all. It was a very aggressive, proactive, organized at the community level with the Department of Health to go out into the community where people who were at risk but wouldn't realize they were at risk. Homeless shelters, go to gay bars, go in the street, get people tested immediately and don't leave them until you get it back. When you get it back, don't give them a prescription give them a month's supply of drug, and then give them a prescription, and then say, call us when you're out to make sure they do it. If they say, I don't have a cell phone, they give them a cell phone. I mean, it is an incredible program, and the incidence has gone down dramatically. In New York State, Governor Cuomo looked at that and said, we want to start doing the same thing in New York, and he started it in New York, and the same thing has happened. We, in Washington, D.C., which is one of the most heavily burdened of infection. We did the same thing in, in, in Washington, D.C. in association with the mayor and the Department of Health, and it went down. So the answer to your question, if we could do everything the way San Francisco did it, it would be wonderful. The problem is San Francisco is not rural Mississippi, and that's what we've been talking about vis-a-vis -vis community, right? Um, I believe you've had your hand up like the whole time, uh, right there in the second row. <laughs> yeah, great. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Dumont. I've um, been working with HIV um, research and whatnot for about 10 years. Um, Jim, you mentioned that the, um, the need that we really have right now is to keep the energy up and keep people engaged and do more research. How do we do that? How do we get people, other than those of us, who are in the room who have been trying to work on this for quite a long time, how do we get that energy back up? How do we get other people to keep thinking about HIV? Yes. Well, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> she asked you, Jim. Yeah. So I think, I think, uh, I think when we look back on what mobilized uh, society was uh, enormous death rates. And so, um, you know, I can, Tony and I can remember uh, uh, well-meaning activists uh, coming and uh, criticizing us in, in uh, uh, almost violent ways. And then um, if we started to feel bad for ourselves, the next time there was a meeting, they were dead. And, uh, and this happened over and over and over. And, and uh, the fact that AIDS was palpable in, in many communities in the United States and Africa, the people uh, who were dying walking the streets, um, was something that was very hard for all of us to deal with. And, and I think society eventually came around to that. And the activism was, we want to save lives. I can remember Larry Kramer, the famous Larry Kramer, saying to me, you're irrelevant now because prevention is not as important as saving our lives. And, and that, it, you don't duplicate that, but you have to rem remember it. And uh, you know, I'm not a. I, 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 the, the worst thing for me is any kind of premature declaration of victory. We still have 40 million people out there in the world, 
infected with HIV. And taking our feet off the gas means 40 million people are going to die. And, and, and there's still a million or two every year who get infected. And those people are going to get into that same situation. So we need more science, but we also need more recognition. And, and the Trump initiative provides us with that. We need to start seeing the faces again. We still have 15,000 people. Why should anybody die of HIV in the United States? That's ridiculous. You know? It's like, it's like somebody getting, uh, having breast cancer diagnosed and say, oh, we just won't get treated and see what happens. Now, that happens too, but it shouldn't happen. These kinds of things shouldn't happen in a country like ours. No one should die of HIV in this country. Every single case is a, is a criminal act in, against society. And we need to rem remember that again. I think we have time for gentleman in the checkered shirt. I Good morning. Um, I'm Justin Smith. I am a proud graduate of Emory Rollins School of Public Health. Um, and uh, you won't remember this, but I worked at Dr. Fauci's lab many years ago as an undergrad, so it's really great to see all of you again. <laughs> My question is, uh, well, twofold. So one, what is an innovation that you've seen in global HIV that we haven't implemented in the US that we should? And for Dr. Fauci, how are you thinking about kind of the balance when you're looking at the NIH budget that you, ha that you have oversight of between discovery science and implementation science since we have uh, lots of tools that we aren't effectively using um, and it seems like we might need to invest more in how we implement those right. effectively. Okay, I'll answer that second question and Mark is better positioned to do the first. So you're absolutely correct. We, we don't want to give up on implement, uh, on innovation science, because we still need a vaccine. I mean, if you really want to put the nail in the coffin of HIV, you get a good vaccine. And you don't even need a 90% effective vaccine. You could probably do it with a 55, 60% together with all the other combination we have. So we are very heavily invested in that. But what has happened over the past, I would say, 10 years is a removal of the restraints on implementation science. There was an inertia against implementation science because it would take away from innovation science. And when we found out that our innovations weren't being properly implemented, we made a switch so that we actually are doing much more implementation science. And it is to the credit of PEPFAR, who actually gave us money to do implementation research in Africa together with the CDC and others. So right now, we are very much looking at implementation research the same way we're going to be doing it with the program in the United States. But Mark, maybe you want to answer the first part of the question. The, uh, uh, and I want to be careful about this because we keep looking for a program that you're going to take and implement someplace else. And you're not because the community is going to be very different and the, 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 the forces are the same. The process of getting to the outcome is the same. So um, I've seen many programs that are incredibly innovative that keep people in treatment with un unsuppressed and keep young people who are uninfected in programming at a 99, 95, 99% rate. You can't just take that and transplant that here. But the process you can transplant, which is basically get in, talk to, listen to, what the people in the community are saying, understanding who the forces are, who the people that are listened to in that community are, and support them financially and also with program support so that they can create what will be most impactful. And when you do that, you can solve any problem. I, I have never seen a problem that a community, a delivery problem that a community hasn't solved somewhere. But you can't just take that and transplant it. It's more what was the process to get to that answer. And you know, Agnes Banwahu is going to be on a, a panel with me next in, um, on universal health coverage. You know, now it's how do you apply HIV to universal health coverage. They actually had a way, they, they had access to human papillomavirus vaccine a year before they implemented it. But they knew if they went to implement it right away, it was going to fail. So they took a year to really get into the community to understand and prepare them. And then when they rolled it out, they got 99%, they got 90% covered. Had they start, but it wasn't, you know, we're going to do it this way. It was you have to get in and understand. And that process is replicable. That process can be used in the United States. Mike Sag did it. He did PEPFAR programs in Zambia at the beginning. 
um, and, and he went back to work in rural Alabama. He created Zambam, Zambia, Alabama. We're going to learn from Zambia how to get into rural communities, and we're going to bring it to Alabama. But it's that process piece. It's not the programmatic cookie cutter piece. Unfortunately, that's our time. Thank you all so much for coming in. Thank you.